And this webinar will be recorded following NOAA privacy guidelines in order to allow individuals access to the content, get, even if they are unable to attend the webinar in real time. By joining and participating in the meeting, consent is being given to the recording. For additional information, see the Privacy Act statement linked in the calendar invite. And yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Just uh, from Century to Headquarters STI. Um, to today's guest speaker series. Today we have three meteorologists from the Milwaukee Sullivan office to discuss this topic of Wisconsin's first February tornadoes from forecast to IDSS to warnings. These forecasters are Andrew Quigley, Cameron Miller, and Kevin Wagner. After they finish their presentation, I'll open it up to questions. Feel free to, to post questions in the chat as the presentation goes along and we will get to them after the presentation. And with that, I'll pass it on to whoever wants to start first. All right, Cameron Miller here, um, National Weather Service Milwaukee Sullivan, uh, as Andy introduced. Um, so yeah, today we'll be revisiting um, our first um, ever in recorded history, uh, February tornadoes in Wisconsin. So um, looking at what we'll talk about today, uh, we're gonna go over a, a quick event overview. Uh, we'll talk about the, the buildup to the event as well. Um, some of the forecast concerns that were leading up to the event, some of the pre-event messaging that we did for it. And then um, I'll go through that. And then Andrew Quigley is going to take over, talk about the event day, and then um, some of the mesoanalysis leading up to the event. And then Kevin Wagner was actually the warning operator during the event. So he'll go through what he was seeing on radar, what his thoughts were, and some of the outcomes from some of the warnings that we had out there. And then we'll do a wrap up with key takeaways. So just a quick recap here, the Albany EF1 tornado um, roughly started just off to the northwest of Judah in, uh, in southern Wisconsin and went up to Albany on uh, Greene County, right, right along the Wisconsin Illinois border there. Um, it was one of our most visible tornadoes of the day just because it occurred late in the afternoon there. A lot of chasers were on it, um, had good view uh, of it. It was on the ground for about eight, uh, eight miles there uh, with the 50 yards and was on the ground for 10 minutes. And uh, as far as some of the uh, damage was concerned, um, there was damage to a campsite near the end of the track, which it's a good thing that this occurred in February. Otherwise, you know, um, if it had occurred six months later uh, in June, there could have very well have been people at this campground. Um, there was also some damage to houses along the way. For example, here in the center on the bottom, a uh, chicken coop actually flew into this prefab home here and ripped off the walls, there was actually some poor anchoring on this house. Um, uh, according to our surveyors that were out there, it was actually glue that was holding this thing together, so that wasn't very good. Um, and then on the right here, we have an image of a uh, garage that was basically ripped off its foundation there, but the tractors and four-wheelers inside were um, left in place there. So looking at EF1 damage out of uh, some of the stuff that we observed out of this tornado. And then the second tornado occurred uh, shortly after the first EF1 um, that went through Albany there. Uh, it occurred from Evansville to Lake Koshkanon, um, had a path length of 26.2 uh, miles per hour. You know the long track terminology can be a little bit uh, iffy. Some people say it's 15 and above, some people say it's 25, maybe like 15 above, but 26 miles is pretty good by Wisconsin standards here. And uh, um, we had that on the ground uh, from 539 to 617, uh, close to a half hour there. Um, and yeah, it was our e uh, first EF2 um, recorded in Southern Wisconsin in February. And then looking at some of the damage here, uh, most of this damage, this EF2 damage that we saw was uh, mostly on a farmstead um, that we saw off to the east of Evansville. Um, some of the damage here, we have a concrete culvert uh, that was thrown across the road into a, a farm field that was right across from the farmstead. A um, little bit of a Bucks reference here, but fear the deer, maybe fear the flying deer. I mean, there was a mangled uh, John Deere sprayer uh, that got tumbled and um, mangled on that farmstead there. Actually pretty impressive here, a leafless, uh, what we think is an oak tree here. Um, basically, it's not toppled over. That's actually the trunk that was snapped and then the trunk is completely embedded in the ground there. Um, so that was pretty impressive. Um, and surveyors made note of that. And then some grain bins also carried into the farm field across the road. 
And here was a little bit of an example of um, some of the messaging that went right with this particular storm here. Um, this was actually a house um, close to Evansville here that had the roof, roof ripped off and pots into the yard and some extensive damage to the house here. And if you look at um, this bed here, you can actually see some uh, a stick or um, other piece of debris uh, basically stuck into the wall a few inches from the headboard here. Luckily, this family was not in bed. They were actually um, about to sit down and have dinner here, but um, it kind of illustrates, you know, some things that can actually uh, make you think about, um, you know, getting that messaging out on time, um, what would happen if they, this had happened overnight, people were in bed, stuff like that. So um, just a little bit of interesting, uh, you know, things that we saw. Uh, with this particular uh, storm out there in, near Evansville. And as far as aftermath is concerned, uh, we had a lot of media coverage from uh, local and also national uh, news outlets. Had multiple local media interviews, especially with the uh, Evansville, the Lake, uh, Lake Koshkin on EF2 tornado. Um, Andrew's there actually talking to our NBC station. Uh, There's a bunch of mutual aid provided by surrounding communities. Uh, the city of Beloit, which is just off to the south of the, um, the tornado pass there, provided mutual aid. And then we had a bunch of press conferences with local law enforcement and emergency management as well. So just to put these tornadoes in a historical context here, we haven't had uh, tornado warnings um, between 1986 to 2023 in this in February in the state of Wisconsin ever, um, and there haven't been any tornadoes in the month of February in our recorded history. Basically, when we since we've started uh, recording tornadoes in uh, Wisconsin here, so looking back at some of the severe warnings that we've issued in the past, we had about nine in 1999 in February, uh, four in 2008 in February, and then three in 2017 and just to put things in context here on february 8th we actually issued eight severe um thunderstorm warnings and five tornado warnings on on february 8th alone so that basically blew everything else out of the water um there and we have had Jan uh, tornadoes in january and march before but never in february um it was kind of a running joke one of our forecasters re retired recently and he was always wondering when we'd kind of topple that one record there. And he finally retired and the year after he retired, we finally got our February tornado. So I think we thought that was kind of interesting, kind of funny. But, um, and overall this winter has been really weird for Wisconsin. Um, it was basically our warmest on record by 2.3 degrees. Um, so we were basically shattered that old warmest winter record uh, pretty heavy handedly there. Um, we had our warmest, uh, high temperature recorded in the state of Wisconsin down in Kenosha in southeast Wisconsin. That was 77. And most of northern Wisconsin is about 60 inches behind where they should be on um, uh, snowfall for the, the season. So when we're looking at severe weather in Wisconsin, um, usually there's three gotchas for uh, preventing severe weather uh, in February. It's usually because it's winter. But if we do manage to get a warm sector up in here, um, we usually have two other confounding factors um, that kind of hold severe weather back. And it's usually a uh, cool breeze, kind of a cold breeze, if you will, coming off the lake, and then what we call the cheddar curtain. And I'll explain that in a little bit here. So first off, obviously it's winter. You're not really expecting severe weather in winter. Um, looking at some of the climate normals from our long-term climate sites here. Um, Milwaukee usually has a high of 32 um, in, on February 8th. Uh, Madison usually a high of 29 on February 8th. Madison actually reached a high of 55 on February 8th and Milwaukee reached a high of 59. Both of those were records for February 8th there. And then kind of looking at our no risk average February snow depth, usually we're ranging about 3.9 to 9.8. Um, you know, average snow depth for, for February here. And um, our actual observed local snow depth is on the bottom right there. And um, usually we round to the nearest inch there, a um, lot of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 there. So it's effectively just zero across the area. There might've been a few like banks in the ditches, but we uh, essentially didn't have any snow on the ground uh, February there. So going on to the second point here, um, we're talking about the, the cold lake breezes that we tend to get. Um, if we do manage to get a low pressure track 
that's favorable to get a warm sector in here. So usually when we have our stronger low pressure systems in the winter, we're, we're talking about the panhandle hook type systems that come from the panhandle of Oklahoma and then head up through the Missouri River Valley to the middle Mississippi River Valley and then head off towards the Great Lakes here because the greater surface pressure falls are usually in the upper Great Lakes to lower Great Lakes area. Um, but if the low track usually takes a, a more northwesterly path, synoptic flow is actually going to drive some cold fetch off of the lake. And it'll often either undercut the warm sector, if we get that low pressure system taking a more northwesterly path, or it'll completely pinch off the warm sector entirely. We may still get elevated convection. That cold air might slide under um, the warmer air aloft, especially if we get a strong jet in here. And we may get some hail, but um, surface-based severe weather threats like wind and tornadoes usually suffer in situations like this. And then going on to the third point here, um, what we affectionately call the cheddar curtain in the office is the Wisconsin-Illinois border. But it actually, uh, in the springtime, maybe late winter into the springtime here, um, particularly during normal winters, what will happen is if we have a low track from flatter from the west to east, It'll move right along the Wisconsin Illinois border. And what'll happen is it'll drive cold synoptic flow basically off Lake Michigan here, and you'll drive that colder air mass inland. And then it'll halt the northward advance of a warm front here. Um, and again, sort of like the, the previous point here, uh, you might get storms that either latch along the front, latch on the front, and um, either ride along it, um, staying in Illinois, maybe they overrun it and then turn to mush real quickly. Um, but again, surface-based weather threats are going to suffer in situations like that. But if we look at the lead up um, to this particular event on February 8th here, on the morning of uh, February 7th here, we're looking at the uh, or evening of uh, February uh, uh, 7th here, we're looking at the 0Z HREF, and it's already projecting um, a, a low path that's actually all the way to the north and west of where we would expect the typical low track. The typical low track would be kind of south over Iowa here during the winter if we especially have a, a deep digging trough over the central United States here. But that low is actually way off to the north and west here. And um, looking at some of the zero Z and 60 model runs, there was some disagreement in what we'd see on February 8th. Um, there was weak cave, there was potentially a crashing cold front that would come through. And there was just a lot of uncertainty. Um, with those particular uh, thunder chances that we'd have on February 8th here. But if we go to the afternoon forecast, um, looking at the 12Z, February 7th, HREF here, we're doing this forecast here on February 7th in the afternoon, the day before February 8th here, we start to see some ingredients that are about to come together that look like they could be favorable for some severe weather in our area. So the HREF is starting to straighten things out, but we do have a little bit uh, we do have some ifs that we need to straighten out here too. So talking about the goods here, we have that low pressure system off to our north and west. We have that cold front to act as a trigger. And we also have what appears to be a bit of a secondary warm front um, set up uh, across our area here. Um, and that could uh, lead to an area favorable um, uh, spin in the atmosphere there. We also noted that even though the HREF is an ensemble here, kind of looking back to the models, we didn't really notice um, that much of a lake breeze coming in. So winds aren't really tilted um, from the, the east or southeast there, pushing inland there, they're mostly out of the south. Um, looking a little bit aloft here, the eight, uh, the mean 850 millibar heights and winds, we had a strong 50 knot, uh, 50 knot 850 millibar jet as well, um, basically right over southern Wisconsin. Uh, we, we did have low uh, cape building into the area. It was about 500 joules per kilogram of uh, surface-based cape there, but the shear was just enough to be good for the area um, at around 35 to 40 knots. Uh, looking at the last rates, last rates are actually pretty good, ranging from um, 7 to 8 Celsius per kilometer in that 700 to 500 millibar um, layer there. And we did have good SRH that... Uh, those yellow to dark oranges there, that ranges from um, 200 to 300 meters squared per second squared. So definitely a great uh, kinematic space there. But we did have some issues uh, with models convecting there. 
Some ensemble members looked intriguing, uh, namely the her there looked kind of intriguing on that 12Z href run there. But some of the other models um, didn't really have, you know, that uh, favorable looking convection. Um, also, we kind of looking at that uh, isodrosotherm line there that we drew in, that's the uh, 45 degree href uh, isodrosotherm there. Um, we were wondering if the dew points would actually be high enough for uh, this event as well. So some of the ifs here, if some of these models pan out, um, if dew points are high enough, those were one what some of the things that we were wondering about for February 8th. And then we also had a, a wing of warm advection coming through in the morning, and that was kicking off some uh, showers and uh, weak thunderstorm activity, mainly in the late morning to early afternoon. And usually when we get those situations, that's kind of like the kiss of death for um, early season severe weather here in southern Wisconsin, because what will happen is sometimes those showers will linger a little bit longer than expected. Cloud cover will linger behind it here. And you saw some shades of that in the HREF there too. There's a lot of low cloud cover lingering a couple hours after that um, the convection was expected to move through there. So we were wondering if that early afternoon convection moves out quicker than expected, if we get some breaks in the clouds and get more sunshine than expected, will we get more instability? Will storms become surface based? Is the moisture that those dew points that we saw is 45? Um, you know, degree dew points, are those enough for this situation? Um, will those dew points actually mix out if we get more sunshine? And obviously, you know, our model is actually missing lake breezes because, you know, that cold, dense air over the lake that tends to uh, push inland sometimes when models miss that. So some of those ifs were what we were looking at for this event. And um, as you'll see here in the next few slides, Andrew Quigley is going to go over how some of those ifs began to topple um, going into the afternoon here. So highlighting some of those ifs, I just wanted to highlight in the messaging that uh, here on February 7th, we wanted to say that there are a lot of things that need to come together for this conditional threat. A lot of ifs, there's a lot of good things to look at, but uh, we highlighted in our afternoon forecast package on our, our social media here, still in question, a lot of location, timing of thunderstorm developments. Um, we were looking at that early day rainfall, cloud cover attempts, dew points, those all needed to come together. But we still um, highlighted the fact that there could be an isolated spin of potential um, based upon some of the ingredients that we were seeing up there. So, and the SPC actually uh, painted us in a, a marginal risk for February 8th there. So, um, all right. So this is where Andrew Quigley is going to take over and talk about um, the event uh, going into uh, February 8th here uh, during the day. All right, thank you very much, Cam. Uh, so as Cam has highlighted here uh, through the first half of this presentation, uh, we had a lot of climatology, you know, going against us going into the day on February 8th um, that historically speaking would be dampening uh, to our chances for severe weather. Uh, and to this point, we had been messaging that we knew the dynamics were going to be in place, uh, but we had those underlying thermodynamic concerns in terms of were we even going to have a window or thunderstorm potential in our area on the afternoon of February 8th. So my section here uh, really kind of starts to highlight what our ops looked like, uh, particularly in the morning and early afternoon hours of February 8th, when the pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, uh, started to fall into place and we started to make the realization that this could actually happen. So starting with just some early to mid morning trends, so what I'm showing here is just a basic loop of visible satellite uh, from the morning of February 8th. And this runs from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Time. And where I'm gonna wanna direct your attention to on this animation is the cloud cover uh, that we've got moving across portions of Southwestern, South Central, and Southeastern Wisconsin. And as you can see from just a broad perspective, um, as we looked at this image on the morning of February 8th, uh, our eyes started to open a little bit because where we might have been expecting more of a kind of just broadly uniform kind of stratus deck coming in that morning, uh, we could see that was quite the contrary. And in specific, number one, if we look in southeastern Wisconsin, kind of near the Lake Michigan shoreline and the Milwaukee metro area, 
you can see we spent most of the early to mid morning hours on February 8th virtually in mostly sunny skies. We only really had some high cirrus that moved over. And then even over southwestern and south central Wisconsin, moving closer to the Madison area and the locations that would ultimately experience severe weather on the afternoon and the 8th, we can see we have cloud cover, um, but it's more of a kind of alto to strato cumulus, if you want to call it that. Uh, and it's not uniform and there's still breaks of sunshine that are getting through. And that was alarming to us as we went through the morning hours on February 8th because the surface temperatures with us being in the warm sector of that developing surface low uh, were really able to soar already by the mid to late morning hours. So the surface ops I'm showing you here, uh, I have noted, but just for awareness, are between 8 a.m. and noon central time on February 8th. And you can see in those areas that we were looking at on the visible satellite imagery, first over southeastern Wisconsin, we saw temperatures by the lunch hour get into the mid and even upper 50s, uh, you know, underneath those mostly sunny skies. But then also over south central Wisconsin, uh, with those breaks in that cloud deck that we had coming in, temperatures were still able to get into the low to mid 50s. And I think at this point, it's a good time to remind everybody uh, the slide that Cam showed earlier with our normals for this time of year. It's the first week of February. Uh, normal temperatures in Madison and Milwaukee are supposed to be in the low to mid 20s at this time of year. And already by lunchtime uh, on February 8th, we've got temperatures in the low to even upper 50s. So we were already by lunchtime uh, kind of in that 25 to 30 degree above normal range. Uh, so that was quite concerning uh, just based on the satellite trends alone. If you add those concerning satellite trends to that rainfall that we were expecting, um, showing you guys here a radar loop running from about 10.30 to 12.30 on February 8th, you can see that not only were the clouds underperforming in our area, uh, but the rainfall was as well. Looking at those earlier HREF forecasts and seeing those QPF footprints, we had thoughts that maybe we would have more widespread kind of stratiform shower coverage with that wing of warm infection coming in. Uh, but as you can see, all we really got on that morning was just a very narrow, at least east to west speaking, band of kind of showers, isolated thunder showers that moved very quickly uh, off to the northeast. And if you combine these underperforming showers uh, along with those underperforming morning clouds that we experienced with the fact that in Iowa, uh, and again, this animation is just visible satellite running over the same time period as that radar loop. If you combine all those underperforming mechanisms that we had in place in our area with the fact that there was a dry slot over Iowa uh, with mostly sunny skies, um, that was cause for concern, at least in terms of our surface temperatures, uh, because we didn't really quite get the dampening that we would have perhaps anticipated through early morning with those clouds and warm infection showers. But we also had a sector of mostly sunny skies moving in to help us recover from any dampening that occurred and then build upon uh, the temperatures that we had already built through mid-morning. And we can see that really well. Uh, just in an animation uh, of our afternoon surface hobs here, running from noon to three o'clock on February 8th. And you can see uh, temperatures holding steady in the low to mid 50s, and then really honing in on the area that saw the most action on February 8th. We can see temperatures even got up into the upper 50s and low 60s in spots. So this gave us a net result kind of bottom line going into the early afternoon hours on February 8th of the fact that we had basically underperforming clouds and rain in our area, and then a rapidly advancing open warm sector that was coming together over Iowa. And I do apologize, these OBS are a bit tiny for some screens. Uh, so I would just highlight that this warm sector that's bounded kind of in the orange dashes was characterized by temperatures in the upper 50s, even low 60s, uh, with surface dew points mostly in the mid to upper 40s, but even isolated 50s in places. And this warm sector uh, was kind of characteristically bounded by an anticipated secondary warm front that was quickly pushing in behind the departing upper clouds and rain as well as a more synoptic cold front over central Minnesota and northwestern Iowa. And this was about the time that the alarm bells started to go off here at our office, 
um, because this was early afternoon and there was really nothing that was going to impede this warm sector from advancing northeast and into our area by peak heating of the day. So really, where coming into this morning, we had had questions given the surface thermodynamic conditions. It was very clear going into the afternoon hours on February 8th that we were going to have a corridor potentially of surface-based storm potential in our area. And that was cause for concern and cause for us to start ringing some alarm bells. So you may ask, well, what, you know, why was there so much concern? And Cam did a really good job of highlighting uh, some of these things in his section, uh, but we're gonna put it all together here. Um, so we just wanna quickly revisit the near storm environment that we were looking at on that day. Uh, and rather than doing it uh, just through static images or GIFs, we've actually thrown together uh, just a basic little app for you guys in uh, GIS Experience Builder. So this app is going to be accessible in one of two ways. You can either click on the link here directly on the slide and it should take you to that application, or you can follow the link uh, that we are about to drop in chat here. Uh, so we just put that link into chat. So either or that should work. Uh, and this has been shared uh, organization wide with all of the National Weather Service. So you will probably be prompted to log in with your CAC credentials. Um, but as long as you do that, uh, you should be able to pull up that application and follow along with us. And just one bookkeeping item, uh, once we get over to that app, you'll see uh, that we had several um, basic like different fields, meteorological fields that were uh, included in this app. And those fields span uh, basically CONUS to Midwest type of scales over multiple time periods. So if you find yourself getting lost in space in any of this information, because there is a decent amount there, just remind yourself that the area of action on this day was Southern Wisconsin and Northern Illinois, and you can't really go wrong. So without further ado, I am going to move over to this application. And what I want to do is just confirm with everybody in the audience that you can indeed see the application. All right, perfect. I'm seeing several thumbs up, so that looks encouraging. So we will jump right in then uh, with that. So just a few little housekeeping items here just to help you guys get your bearings as we jump into this application. Uh, we do have a total of eight variables shared with you. Uh, and you can find all of those at the top, uh, at the tabs, I should say, located at the top of the screen. Uh, and we may not share every single one of them in the interest of time today, um, but if you do get curious and you want to take a deeper dive for yourself, uh, just go to those tabs and you should be able to see the variables uh, as they are described in the tab names. And then just two other uh, brief items, given that we have some interactive color fills here, uh, you may be wondering what those colors correspond to in terms of numeric values. So if you ever get curious at any point during this demo, you can just find a legend icon here in the lower left corner of the screen, and that'll pull up basically the coloration, the color table, and what it corresponds to in terms of numeric values. And then finally, we may utilize this feature here at the end of our presentation, uh, depending on the flow of it. But there is an option here in the bottom right of your screen to search basically specific addresses or places. So you can look up quite literally the communities that we had that were impacted on this afternoon and really take in a, a close dive and see how these variables stacked up in those areas. So those are just some bookkeeping items just for the people that are following along at home and doing some playing along with it. But we will uh, jump in here and start with our mid-level lapse rates. So we've talked a lot about the surface thermodynamics uh, and what we had coming into place. And uh, Cam did a great job uh, in his part of the presentation, kind of outlining some of the things that we knew uh, were going to be in place such that if they were to combine with favorable conditions at the surface, we're going to give us cause for concern. So while we're on the topic of thermo, you know, we've spent the last several slides talking about how the surface conditions really started to come together through late morning. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, off to our west, we can really see that we had here at 18Z, uh, which is the layer and time step I'm showing you right now, we had a very good plume of mid-level lapse rates that were in place, kind of swinging from the plains into the Mississippi Valley. And you can see, based on our legend here at left, that really this plume of lapse rates 
had values anywhere between seven uh, to over eight degrees Celsius per kilometer. So very steep, uh, you know, lapse rates in the mid levels, plenty of instability there, such that when we combined those with what we had coming together at the surface in terms of temperatures, and I will, as this layer come up, comes up, uh, let you know that this is at 23Z on February 8th. You can see that those steep mid-level lapse rates combined with the surface conditions that we had coming together across our part of the state were sufficient uh, for a plume of, and you could say weak or modest instability, um, but sufficient for the development of convection, essentially, given all the other pieces that we had coming together. And once we knew that we were going to have the potential for storms in that plume of instability building into our area, it was cause for concern because as Cam has already highlighted, that afternoon, because of the kinematics that we had in place in the environment, we had effective bulk shear values uh, that were more than sufficient for the organization of convection within that warm sector. As you can see here at 23Z, we had values anywhere between 30 to 40 plus knots over south central Wisconsin. But then also, uh, as Cam did a great job of highlighting, we had great directional shear in place as well on this day, such that by the time we got to 23Z on the afternoon of February 8th, we had effective storm relative helicity values, uh, really ranging between 250 to 400 plus meters squared per second squared, uh, which we all know as meteorologists is above and beyond what you need uh, to get a potential for tornadoes in a near storm environment. So this overlap of the you know, surface thermodynamics that were coming together uh, combined with the pieces that we knew leading into this event were going to be coming together really set the stage for us by the time we got to late afternoon on February 8th uh, and really primed an environment that was favorable for organized supercellular convection. Uh, so you can see here, really building into south central wisconsin we had supercell composite values which do a really good job of illustrating kind of the convergence of all of these ingredients that we had coming together we had really supercell composite values uh, getting into the three to four range and if we zoom in actually precisely to evansville which of course was one of the communities that was impacted we can see you know focusing in on evansville that we had values really you know between three and four uh, and they even increased moving further southwest into the area that we saw the Albany tornado occur. So that was concerning. Uh, but as we know, not all supercells produce tornadoes. But given that we had the directional shear, the SRH in place, we not only had an environment that was favorable for supercell thunderstorms in our area, but we had an environment that should one of those supercells really mature and become dominant, it was going to become favorable for tornadoes and potentially strong ones at that. Uh, as the effective significant tornado parameter uh, layer here that we've got turned on for you at 23Z illustrates. Uh, again, really any values above one, uh, we know are at least uh, kind of anecdotally favorable for strong tornadoes. And we had those coming into place across South Central Wisconsin on the afternoon of February 8th. Uh, I know there's a lot more here that we could show, uh, but in the interest of time, I am gonna go back uh, to our presentation. Uh, but this was kind of the key key hitting facts of what we had coming together and why it was really time to be so concerned here locally. So if I move back to our presentation, and I'm just going to do one more poll of the audience just to confirm that I've moved back to the PowerPoint. You're good. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, really, you know, with all of this coming together uh, and really the whites of the eyes of the events now kind of in place uh, going into the afternoon of February 8th, this kind of took us into the next phase of the event. Uh, and at this point, you know, afternoon time, uh, it was clear that we were going to have a window for storm potential. Uh, and with that, uh, we could see severe weather and uh, potentially an unprecedented tornado potential. So really, uh, at this point in the event, uh, you know, a lot of the forecast mystery had been resolved and, you know, the majority of the rest of the work was just done uh, in terms of, as the slide says, guiding Southern Wisconsin through that forecast to warning gap and really providing uh, as much information as timely as possible to our core partners and the public to get them ready for this window of potential that was opening up, uh, despite the fact that against all odds, it was the beginning of February 
Uh, and it's certainly something that we're not typically talking about. So this looked basically, uh, first and foremost, just as a process of sounding the alarm and making it public. So about noon to 1230 uh, on February 8th, as we saw all these pieces coming together uh, for severe weather in our area, we basically had an impromptu meeting in ops in our area. Uh, and we got all the forecast staff that we had uh, here locally uh, that day, as well as our managers together. Uh, I mean, just basically had a quick kind of impromptu meeting stating that a window of potential for severe weather, possibly tornadoes was opening up. And as we had that impromptu meeting, uh, one of our lead forecasters was working really hard to get some timely updates out on our AFD. Um, there was a lot of technical discussion that went into that update, but our biggest kind of key focus in that update was to make sure our key messages headline was updated and current going into the afternoon hours, as you can see here from the 12.28 p.m. update on February 8th. We really wanted to make sure that that AFD was starting to convey uh, the threat that was opening up across South Central Wisconsin. But as we all know, uh, as forecasters, the work doesn't stop there in terms of updating the, the technical forecast products. So a lot of sounding the alarm also went into the messaging of that forecast and, and kind of translating it into actionable information for our core partners in the public. And on this day in particular, uh, a technique that we leveraged quite a bit uh, was the use of basically mesoscale graphics that highlighted the basic meteorology of what we were looking at. Uh, and then basically the one to two hour expectations for how it was going to evolve and what that meant for the people of South Central Wisconsin. So what I'm showing you here is the first such graphic that we produced on this day. And this was produced at about 1130 in the morning. And as you can see, it's just highlighting that warm sector that we were looking at previously that we could see developing over Iowa and really just communicating that while it was still cloudy and we even had some rain across South Central Wisconsin, that we were going to see that warm sector quickly move into our area during the afternoon, uh, leading to that second window of potential thunderstorm activity. And we took this graphic and we wanted to spread it far and wide over as many platforms as we could. So this is really a, a great use case of what uh, forecast to warning gap IDSS could look like in an NWS chat 2.0 era. We really wanted to make sure that these graphics were getting out on Slack such that our EMs and broadcast partners uh, could see what we were looking at and see how that translated uh, to threats in near-term forecast expectations. But we also wanted to leverage the dissemination of these graphics uh, kind of through weather stories that we could put on our webpage as well as on social media for public awareness. So that was a big thing. We wanted to get that graphic out. And we wanted to get it out on as many platforms as we possibly could to really sound the alarm and let people know uh, that this could happen and you should start planning now. Uh, finally, the one decision we made that afternoon, uh, and normally uh, when we're dealing with a partner email, DSS packet type topic for severe weather, we typically reserve those sorts of uh, emails and messages for slight to enhanced risk type days. Uh, but the last thing we decided to do on this afternoon is that despite the fact it was a marginal risk day from the SPC, and really from a purely scientific point was a marginal day um, from a coverage standpoint of storms, we did make the decision given the impacts, given that it was February 8th, to send a partner email out at about one o'clock that afternoon, just to give that one last extra tap on the shoulder to everybody to make them aware uh, that this is a real threat and that you should be planning now. And once we had accomplished that goal, of sounding the alarm, uh, it was just really from that point forward, uh, providing a play-by-play -play almost hour by hour uh, for the public and our partners uh, to get them to the basically initiation time of this event and the onset of warning ops. So this was a follow-up graphic sent at 1.30. You can see the warm sector is just progressing east through Iowa, approaching southwest Wisconsin. You can see we're highlighting those fronts. You can see the cumulus development is starting to proceed within that warm sector. And we're just communicating that this is going to continue moving northeast. Expect what you're seeing in Iowa right now to start to occur over Iowa, or excuse me, Illinois and Wisconsin over the next couple hours. And a uh, similar approach, we leverage Slack, we leverage social media to disseminate these graphics to keep everybody aware. And finally, at 2.30, we kind of sent our last set of forecast to warning gap messaging out. 
And this occurred as initiation was beginning uh, across eastern Iowa, very near the Mississippi River. And you can see at this point, we had storms starting to develop. They were messy. They were attempting to mature and were sub-severe at this point. Um, but we knew with everything else that we had in place, uh, the environment moving in to Illinois and South Central Wisconsin was going to be conducive for them to organize. Uh, and this was the last graphic, essentially, that we sent out in the forecast, the warning gap phase of the event, letting people know that, you know, the anticipated thunderstorm development was ongoing to our south southwest. Uh, and despite the fact that they were still down in Iowa, they were going to move quick and they were going to move into an environment favorable for organization and potential tornadoes. So with that, uh, that gets us pretty much to the warning phase of this event. And with that, uh, I will pass it off to our fair forecaster, Kevin Wagner, who was working the radar with uh, one of our other forecasters that night. Thank you. All right. So yes, I'm lead meteorologist Kevin Wagner, and I was actually working this event from days prior all the way up through the event and even into the next day doing the storm surveys. So the next couple slides or, or next few slides we're gonna go through is kind of the warning operations and kind of just the whole thought process for this unique event. So all of our ifs were just came together. So we're all prepared. We had that new meeting where we were talking that this is actually gonna happen. So now we gotta prepare, prepare for when it actually does. Um, so the environment was conducive, but everything, and now it's time to prepare. So it's a marginal risk in February. Not only February, it's early February. So how do you staff something like that? Yeah, we have our, our typical staffing model, but for early February, it's kind of hard to gauge how to do that. So what we actually did is it was kind of nice. We had consistency through the day. Um, so our MESOA messaging and DSS person was Andrew. He actually started the morning as well and worked a few days before. So he had consistency kind of knowing how the environment evolved through the day and then we had our day our other day crew held over she worked the that was taylor she worked on um, data phones and so she was aware of what was going on and then i took over as primary radar operator just kind of given the consistency and then our evening shift came in and we had one that kind of just took over the other other side of the house you know um, task grids and just kind of phone calls helping that clean up and then we had michaela who's actually one of our new new people here, she just finished her rack and we put her on a radar, radar shift as our secondary operator as she came in in the afternoon. So not only were we focusing in on the weather, but we're also kind of in a little bit of a training mode as well. But luckily she was here and she did a very good job with it. And she actually got to issue her first severe thunderstorm warning on this event. So congrats to her. But as things kind of formed, it's we're seeing the stuff kind of develop, the environments there, we're seeing some some stronger storms kind of develop in Iowa. And we actually get the severe thunderstorm warnings out across our southwestern portions of our CWA in, in collaboration with uh, Davenport. So we're seeing it, it's beginning, we're starting to move in. And then as time evolves, you know, as it's kind of going through a Lafayette County through the town of Gratiot and South Wayne, we're starting to see things get a little more interesting. You know, we got this little supercell that's try trying to go just south of the Wisconsin Illinois border. And so, you know, the environment's there. It's still February, so we still got still have some concerns. And but it's looking really interesting. You know, you're getting you got these two looking good looking cells. Um, you're seeing mid level rotation. Um, for us, this area of our CWA, it's you know we're kind of shooting kind of high above the storm. So, you know, these scans are anywhere from four to five, almost six thousand feet up, looking at these storms. So it's kind of like yeah, we're kind of like I don't kind of iffy on what's going on. But again, the environment's there. So that's kind of give it hedging our bets towards that something's happening, something's getting a little interesting. And so as the things evolve, um, I know when this, the leading supercell kind of passed over the Wisconsin Illinois border, we let Davenport know that we were gonna warn it. Um, we actually put a tornado possible tag on it, just given the environment. And they said, it's all yours, have fun with it. And that's what we did. So the other concerning thing is, as it kind of moved north, you had this leading supercell. That was kind of moving north, but then you had this little feature back here. It's a little line QLCS feature, and that was kind of moving more eastward. So these things were kind of moving, looking like they might start to merge. And then once things kind of get get funny and maybe interact, that's when things are gonna gonna start to look a little more interesting. And at this point, in my mind, I was like. This is exactly how I felt. Uh -uh. I don't like. I don't like where this is going. So 
again, the environment is there, the thing continued to evolve, and by five o'clock, it's just looking really interesting. Um, some concerns with these, um, the, the rotation on this, on this storm, you know, maybe vertical side lobing, it just was offset from the reflectivity. But again, we were kind of far, far away from our radar and shooting, overshooting kind of things. So again, some concerns still going on, but also the persistency of this is giving, giving me pause on, you know, things are getting funny here. So, and even what really helped kind of solidify what was going on and kind of confirming what was confirming our suspicions is looking up in the atmosphere, not just looking at that half degree scan, but also looking at the 0.9, 1.3. And you see this consistency with height. You can really see the supercell, leading supercell heading towards Monroe, and then you got the that line back to the west of it. And so at this point, five o'clock hour, things are just gonna start to fall into place and it's gonna go quickly. Things quickly ramp up, they're coming together. That merger is looking most looking more likely. Um, continue to see um, the rotation, even if it's slightly offset, you know, that was still giving me pause. Um, but at this time, you know, things just kind of start to fall into place and they just kind of go real quick at, you know, just two minutes past the hour. It's, it's like looking at radar. We got this nice little kidney bean of a supercell, nice little QLCS there. And it's, we have the environment as Andrew went over. It is favorable environment for us to see something. And with it continuing to look like it's going to merge and given how closely it is, yeah. You have to trust in the Mesoway and trust in what's going on. Because at this point, you might not see it until it's too late. Again, we're shooting four to 5,000 feet up for this area. So again, favorable environment. And then quickly right after that, got the next scan in. And it was, I, I was, my concerns were like, all right, we're, we're going to, we're going to make history. We're going to issue the first tornado warning in Wisconsin history for February. Crazy idea, but we're going to do it. So. I'm pretty sure I yelled this out loud, right? Yeah, I said, we're gonna we're gonna do this. And then right after that, we issued the first warning. Again, my main focus was kind of on this leading supercell. We were starting to get a few um, wall cloud reports around this area. And again, that persistent, that persistent rotation that we're seeing. Again, still some concern with it being offset from the main, from the reflectivity. But again, again, my focus was on the first one initially, but then you also have to think that QLCS is in the same environment. And you're still seeing, if you see something over here by South Wayne, you're still seeing some rotation evident with this system. So it's like, again, the main focus on this, but you also can't forget about the one back to the West. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know which one's gonna produce and the environment's conducive for both of them. So just to cover our bases, we actually went ahead and did a double tornado warning for each feature. Um, Cause I didn't know where they were gonna interact. I didn't know where, which one was gonna produce. So kind of just cover our bases. And really in the warning field, we kind of kept it a little bit broader just to kind of cover any deviant motion or anything like that. So again, utilizing the upper scans really kind of shows this mid-level meso and how it's really behaving and really kind of really looking good for something to actually happen. So we did decided to pull the trigger with it. And so here's just kind of the radar loop as it kind of goes through. But again, this was a quick 10 minutes of radar decision making. So a lot going through your head, a lot going through the head, trying to decide what's going to happen, but also trying to look downstream and potentially what's going to happen with that mental, that mental model. So between uh, 510 and 535, this is when this is when everything kind of starts to go down. Um, you start to see that line to the west start to surge as that deviant left mover supercell kind of merges with it. So it's all within the tornado warning. Um, so feel pretty confident, but also at this time we're getting reports um, actually via Slack from um, from people putting sh um, chaser streams in there, and so we're actually seeing what's going on um, from the chaser stream. We're seeing the um, very defined wall cloud um, develop right around Judah and heading towards Monroe. Um, we're getting reports actually from the Monroe Airport of a wall cloud because they're up on a hill looking down at lower elevation. So there was good visibility and good coverage going on um, during this during this event. So not only do we have the environment, the radar features are looking interesting, um, but we also have good coverage, and we're getting those reports from people. And this is really this is really when my my brain's like, oh, okay, this is this is going, this is going, it's happening. They're about to merge, and Walcott reports coming in. We're starting to get funnel funnel reports coming in. Again, this is 
this is February. This is early February. We don't have really high dew points. I think dew points in the upper 40s, maybe 50s, temperatures in the 50s, nearing 60s. So it's just, it's not typical for us. So it's really trying to overcome those, those biases. Of, this is February. So around, then we have the, the things merging together. And then that's when we start to get our first report. As we get the tournament, as we get the supercell to merge with the, the line come through, we get our first report. A lot of our chasers were over here on this highway between Monroe and Albany. And a lot of our reports were coming from this, from this roadway, which, which gave us the idea that, you know, thinking it would mostly be associated with that leading supercell where the tornado was occurring. And then by a 20 or 520 ish time frame, that's when we start to get more reports that a tornado is actually happening. Again, the initial reports were coming that we're getting a tornado north of the town of Albany. So, so as we're getting confirmation, it's happening, it's on the ground. And then reports just continue to fly in between um, five o'clock or 530, 535 and 541. Um, so this is really when these two storm modes kind of merge together and then just kind of become one. And so we're going to step through the next couple slides. So you have the merger between the supercell and the QLCS. And then in the next couple couple minutes is things are really starting to get interesting. It's not been it's not QLCS now, and it's now becoming mainly a supercell. Um, now at this time we're still getting reports back by Albany that tornadoes, um, there's damage across the area, you know, trailer park getting hit, which was actually the camp sweet mini haha that got hit. Um, a whole uh, dead end street got a lot of damage. So we're still getting reports back upstream, but meanwhile, this is starting to tighten up and look like your classic supercell. You really see the rotation kind of get defined as it crosses the county county line heading in there. So did that bow with the QLCS kind of act as kind of a RFD surge and help help this thing kind of get started? Is it cycling? So in our mind, the environment's still there. We get this merger, we're getting these radar features, we're getting the rotation, we're looking up in the atmosphere. And it's continuing to just look like a classic supercell. Again, it's early February, not expecting to see such a classic looking storm in, in Wisconsin. Um, so as it as this thing finally starts to reveal itself, it really creates that hook, that tight rotation. Everything's starting to line up better than it did downstream, where things were just slightly offset. And this thing's just not looking good. Um, it's heading towards Evansville. Evansville is a pretty large town. It's technically probably considered a suburb of the Madison area. You have a population around 10,000 people, but this is turning into that classic supercell. Um, and it's really just starting to just look good. And that concern just ramps up for me. So really, as it kind of goes through, goes through there, it even kind of looks like you even have a little bit of a donut hole that develops with associated with that rotation with it. So it's going through and we're starting to get reports around the Evansville area that there's there's confirmed tornado going on. And even when you zoom in, you can really kind of see, really see that rotation, even looking up aloft, you really have that tight, tight end rock going on right there. And even again, just continuity with height is just all just confirming what we suspected is actually happening. So, and then you actually, this is the, this is the time um, around 545, is when you actually start to see the initial hints of a tornado degree signature. And that's really when it starts to get to that east side, east, north, east side of Evansville. Um, this is the time when it really starts to hit stuff. And even during the damage surveys, this is the main kind of debris that's being lofted is sheet metal. Um, our Sue was out there and he just, the first thing he said was how much sheet metal was associated with this storm. So you really start to see it pick up here. This is the initial. The initial TDS and it continues with height, and you can kind of see it really kind of matches up with that donut hole on our radar. And here's what it looked like um, with height. These storms are very, very tilted and had good shear, so you could really see how the continuity with this TDS kind of tilts over just below 10,000 feet from its initial conception. But kind of moving forward through the next couple next couple minutes, um, this thing really starts to tighten up rotation, and that TDS with all that sheet metal really start to see that you really start to see that um defined little drop in cc this time i'm not my mind's going racing it's like oh this is bad it's not good not good not going well um so as it's going through it's really kind of just deciding it's like well this is this is really not good it went through major or pretty big area pretty big town we're getting this 
debris signature. You know, really, this is when we're starting to think, and it's like, okay, we really need to ramp up our messaging. And this is, we had a little quick discussion in operations, um, yelled out to the Mezzo A per, or Mezzo A Andrew. It's like, things still looking good, looking good. And collaborated with everyone going on that we decided to go upgrade this to a considerable tag, just given the amount of reports that are coming in, the constant flow of reports, the history that it's having, the environment that it's going through, and what we're seeing on radar. This, this is a typically do not see this in Wisconsin, let alone in February. So this is the time around around 540, 548 to 550. This is when we decided to start to go with um, upgrading the warning to a considerable tag. Because as it, it continues to go and it's heading towards our next big town, Edricton, which has a population of around 8,000 people. So it's just, this thing is just continuing to go and evolve and it doesn't show any signs of stopping. So around, around 20, 20 or sorry, 550, that's when we decided to issue the second one, we did a secondary secondary tornado warning downstream with that considerable tag. Really wanted to hit hit the people, let them know, give them another warning. That way the we alert alerted them. Because after the fact, that was actually the main that was actually the main thing that people had noted. How did they get the warning? It was those we alerts. Those the things that popped up on their phones, that's what alerted. So doing the secondary uh, another warning downstream for the considerable tag to give that extra heads up to these to these areas seemed to really help. So um, by this time, continue to see this thing tighten up and that that TDS just continue to go and just as it goes through Edgerton, you know, lots of thoughts going through through my mind. It's like this is bad. It's going through these populated areas, but from a science side, it's really kind of cool. So just really see it continuing all the way up through Lake Koshkana. So here's a radar loop of the TDS with height as it goes through um, just that 15 minute time frame. So you really start to see it really ramps up as it kind of picks up more of that sheet metal from those barns outside of Evansville and then kind of starts to taper off as it gets towards uh, Lake Koshkana. So really clear features on radar, really kind of simple, easy to understand. So now from six o'clock onwards, things just started, we started losing daytime heating. Again, this is February, so we lost sun, sunlight. We've started to lose our instability, um, but it still still had some pretty tight, had some pretty tight rotation going just north side of uh, Lake Koshkan into uh, next two counties. And we were still getting reports at this time. Um, we had EMs and we have emergency managers and police departments calling us around the area, just letting us know that we're we're still receiving wind damage. There's people still seeing a feature in between the lightning flashes. So just to cover our bases, given the environment, just in case anything got a little squirrely, we did downgrade to a, a base tornado warning as it heads towards the next big town, Fort Atkinson, which has a population of around 12,000, given it still has a tight rotation. But at this time, it was on its downward trend um, for it. So, but again, still concerning, given the history and everything, wanted to do a base, kind of just cover our bases with it. And as it kind of pushed into um, eastern Jefferson County over our office into the Oconomowoc area, this is when it really kind of just kind of became elevated and became a prolific hailer. Um, so at this point, we felt confident that it was done done for the tornado threat. We lost it, um, lost the environment, and it's just moving further east. But still a prolific hailer. Um, not a lot of large hail, but a lot of small hail and just near quarter size hail really cover the roads around the area. So. At this time, me and the radar, op me and Michaela, the other radar operator, our minds were just, we're ready to be done. Give ourselves high fives and it's like, yeah, now the busy work begins. So, so that's kind of the radar perspective. Now the next couple of things kind of going over what makes this unique. Um, not only was this the first tornado recorded in Wisconsin in February, but this is probably the best recorded um, tornadoes that we've seen. Even in the summertime, we don't get these types of reports or videos. Um, so for the first one in Albany, it was very well documented by chasers and spotters. We had several chasers out there and they were sending those reports via social media. And we had other people actually reporting it via Slack and AWS chat 2.0. So we're getting these live updates pretty, pretty easily and pretty quickly. Um, again, the rain-free base was also helping. Um, most of the, these things were moving really quick. So most of the chasers actually got behind the storm but given the rain for grace, they were able to look from the west to the east and actually see the storm and see the tornado as it raced away ahead of them. So, and also the elevated terrain out that way, looking down towards the 
lower elevations really does help as well. But this, make, this is a very unconventional one. Again, during radar operations, um, my focus, again, was on that initial supercell, getting those reports with north of Albany where the supercell was kind of merging with the line. So my mind was kind of really focused in on the initial supercell as a, with that rotation and where the tornado actually happened. Um, but you had, multiple, again, multiple modes going on. You had that QLCS uh, back behind it and a lot of the little other cells that were interacting with it. So that really was the catalyst for us getting these tornadoes is that merger. But where did that merger actually form? Um, again, the initial reports were north of Albany, so just assumed it was with the initial supercell as it merged with the line. But we'll take a look at these radar features here that it actually did not occur with the supercell and actually occurred um, somewhere else. So these lines here are actually the damage path that we surveyed um, for the initial supercell through Green County. So it happened just over the highway by Judah and went through just south of Albany. And so here, here it is on where it aligns with uh, storm relative motion from this, from this event. So the supercell one, again, this was more um, side lobe, vertical side lobe that we we're seeing and just a little offset from the main part of the storm that kind of pendant where you expect it to be. Um, and it just didn't, it seemed just a little too far off from where the damage actually occurred. So you could see the path that kind of moved up this highway kind of north of Albany. But really you have to take a look at this secondary little rotation kind of behind it, really hard to see, but a lot easier to see as you went up in elevation. This, this one matched up a little bit better to the damage pass and a little bit later. So, and that actually occurred at the leading edge of where this QLCS kind of was starting to bow out and merge on the back edge of this, back edge of the, the supercell. So really what confirmed this for us was actually looking at, not only going back and looking at the data and the storm survey, but we had, again, very well documented. Uh, one of our chasers, this is a student from uh, UW Milwaukee who was out there chasing, and he was given this, and with the timestamp and the radar and his location really helped us confirm that this is actually occurring with, with the, that QLCS feature in the back. So it was really interesting. You know, we really focused in on the supercell, but really it was kind of that QLCS stuff. So as we move through time, um, you know, 523, you could really see that wall crowd start to start to develop. And this is actually when we started to see reports or this is where the damage started to begin. Um, not necessarily reaching the ground, but there was damage on the ground and a consistent path for it. And by 530, it was a full blown to really see the defined wall cloud, that funnel, and there's actually debris being able to be seen on the ground with it. And it just matches up with that, that southern mesocyclone, more associated with that QLCS feature. And so, yeah, so very unconventional on how it kind of happened. But if you didn't have that merger, you weren't going to have anything else. That was really the catalyst for us to get that get that tornado going. But again, utilizing the not just the half degree, but the 0.9 to 1.3 scan really helped um, helped with the warning process, along with all the meso way and all the reports that are coming in. And then also having that that, that mindset, uh, thinking ahead that you know this thing's going to merge. So once these merge in this environment, it's going to get things to go. So that really did help all in all with the initial with the initial uh, tornado warnings. Now the second tornado. This is the Evansville one. This is the one that gets most of the got most of the press. This was actually not recorded very well from the chasers because they had got all left behind up in Greene County. A lot of our reports were from the public in Evansville. So you could see this is actually a ring camera from what an NWS forecasters family in Evansville of the tornado moving through. And a lot of our other reports are just from people walking out of a bar, taking a picture of the sky or just stepping out their front door and taking a picture as the video here. So it was really interesting. We, again, even during summertime when we have a good event like this, we do not have this well of coverage and th this many reports. But this really did help us in the warning process and how get those warnings out and get that information out as quickly as we can to keep people safe. But other than that, it was a pretty textbook, pretty textbook supercell, pretty easy. I know when I was a student volunteer, uh, one of the lead forecasters, said to me, yeah, it's easy to do tornado warnings on a supercell, much harder when it's in that junky QLCS type stuff. So, but once we got the reports from Evansville and everything, it was pretty textbook. It was just really just a matter of upgrading and 
making the decision when to end it. So pretty straightforward. But again, this was our not only our first tornado warnings, not only our first confirm, confirmed tornadoes, but this was our first considerable upgrade for a tornado warning in Wisconsin or in Milwaukee area. So, and on top of all this, it's emotionally draining. Um, the weather nerd inside of all of us, this is cool. This thing's a beast. This thing is really picture perfect, but it's going through populated areas. It's heading towards, after it went through Evansville, it's heading towards Edgerton. Edgerton is the home of our ITO Jerry's family. Um, so luckily his family got the warning and they got his 98 year old grandma down to the basement before the tornado actually came through town. So again, it's just an emotional roller coaster, not only from just from the science side, but also you have to think about the people that it's affecting because this is, this is impacting, it's a personal impact for, for us. So, and then you see something like this, you see the TDS as it goes with height, you know, strong NROT, it's, it's draining because you know, this is kind of, even before you start to get the reports and you see this stuff on radar, it's, it's, it's concerning that, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be issues. So, so overall it was straightforward tornado, but still emotionally it does, it does drain. So um, with that, these are the, we'll talk about the main conclusions. So putting it all together, again, this is a unique situation. It's February, early February. We're not typically prepared for how to handle a situation like this. It's a marginal risk. Normally we don't staff that much, but you know, just kind of following the science, you know, the buildup, we kind of identified the ifs, look at all possibilities. What needs to happen before this actually does occur? So kind of ha having that idea, identify the failure, failure points, that's what's, what needs to happen or what doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, at that, at that time we were talking about, you know, the classic saying, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. So even the day before we were even joking, you know, it's a marginal to marginal. We weren't even that sold on it until the day of the event. And that's really where the mezzo analyst role really played in. You start to see the dominoes fall and then you see the environment come together. And it really helped kind of give you that confidence, especially where we have that lack of radar coverage. That's really given us that confidence to really pull the trigger and go with the warning. And with, with that confidence, you know, that was able to give us plenty of lead time. We issued that warning at 50, I believe 505 and the tornado I think that we estimated tornado report around 525. So it gave us 15, 20 minutes of a lead time for the initial tornado warning. So, but that really plays into dedicate someone to the mezzo A role, really gives you that, really gives you that confidence and own the forecast, you know, you know, have someone dedicated to it, looking at it, kind of feeding it into, feeding it into the forecast and adapting your mental model for it. So, and then you just have to adapt to the environment. And then once you start to see the dominoes fall, it's like, you know, typically for a marginal risk, like Andrew said, we don't typically do as much messaging for this, especially in February, because, you know, we do have a lot of false alarms, especially with all the failure points with the cold lake and the usually flow, as it can describe. But this just everything just came together in a perfect storm. So in this case, you really had to adapt to the environment and a ramp up and really shows the power of NWS 2.0, that Slack tool. Partners relied on that. Um, also, we have a Wiscom radio. This is how we get in touch with a lot of our a lot of our partners. That actually was a key role. Um, we had fire departments and people letting us know because they get that directly to the radio that's on their tip, letting them know that this is actually happening. So, and then the radar, trust it, trust them as a way, get the warnings out, anticipate, and then just don't get stuck in the half degree scan because um, utilizing the full scale. And then you know it's weather. Weather's going to weather, and you just have to be have to adapt be open-minded and be prepared for anything that throws at you you know that's what we're here for to keep people safe um with that we'll open it up to questions yeah so it looks like we did have one in the chat about zdr kdp put type stuff probably good for you to answer as the radar yeah. operator honestly things were moving a little too quick and i did not really have the zdr arc or kdp foot up at the time um and really did not kind of go back and look at it I think we had enough just with the base reflectivity kind of gave me enough confidence to just go with that, but definitely something we can look back, look back on. But at the time things kind of moved pretty quick, did not have that up and really paying attention to it. Yeah. I just want to say thank you, um, Andrew Cameron and Kevin here for this, uh, awesome thorough review. Um, 
you know, I think it's a, it's a really nice reflection of one of the, you know, the 10 commandments from the super forecasting book, you know, to do these post postmortems. I know they can be sometimes a struggle given the weather and operations, you know, that just keep on moving. And you're like, how do I have time to get back to this in the midst of everything else going on? Um, but it's helpful to catch these things and can be really helpful for moving, moving forward and making sure, you know, your, your IDSS and all that that you provide is in the best state possible for future events. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, um, again, uh, open it up to any questions, feel free to raise a hand, post a note in chat, um, and we'll, we'll bring them up. Uh, I do have a couple other comments and one question. Um, here, so um, you know, you think about early season tornadoes. You know how much more darkness <laughs> there is. Um, you know, your, a lot of these videos that you were shown are in the dark. Uh, while you were presenting, I looked at what the Evansville, uh, Wisconsin sunset time is on February eighth, and it's five nineteen p.m. Uh, so you know, you, you you add, you know, the thing here with it's an early season tornado preparation is probably already lower in general. And throw on top of it that, you know, you have a lot more darkness um, with that con safety concern. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really a testament. I'm you know, you, that ramping up of the messaging during the day, I think, was, was, was perfect to get people in that right mindset. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, was just, it, was, it was a good case. You know, everything just kind of fell in place with enough lead time for us to be able to message it. But then, you know, we had the right people in the right seats doing the warnings as well. Um, so it was really kind of a... You know, I think a good example of what watch the warning gap operations can look like and, you know, something, you know, that we're hoping to replicate in future events here as well, because it flowed really nicely and it, it doesn't always flow like that. But we were fortunate enough in, in this case that it did. Yeah, and even the reports, just talking to the people that were impacted by this event, that the lead time on the warnings is really what triggered them. Getting the wheel alerts really kind of got them to the basement. I think you had some interesting stories. Yeah, I mean, sure the, the power of WIA, uh, you know, I mean, really came through. Uh, I was one of the couple teams that surveyed some of the damage in Evansville, and virtually everybody we spoke to, um, you know, that was unfortunately impacted by the tornado, you know, stated that they got the warnings on their phones, and that was basically what it took for them to get to the shelter. Um, unfortunately, we did have a couple people, you know, you do hear the stories of people needing to confirmations of a threat before acting upon it. So uh, we did hear some stories uh, from people that got the WIA and then went to the window to see it coming. Um, but luckily, as you were saying, Andy, even though the, the sunset is early, um, given the mode of the storm and where the tornado formed, uh, there was enough visibility that even though they were doing what we teach them not to do, which is to go to the window to visually confirm, um, they were thankfully combined with the WIA and then the visual confirmations able to see it. So absolutely. Um, you did get a, a response there in chat um, from, from Paul uh, Schlatter on Aaron's catch. It looks like Aaron's also on in there. So take a quick look at those. Um, you know, I also want to add that the uh, if <laughs> AFD key message update change, really nice. Again, it's all that get everybody prepped in the mindset you know if you have everybody prepped before the warnings come out that's you know that that that's the ideal spot right um you know you you had shown that um interactive um interactive map or earlier mm -hmm. and thanks for yeah. posting that into chat while you're doing the presentation you know if others want to do that same thing um do you have any resources you'd like to share on that and i'm assuming those are all like kml files for all the imagery but i could be wrong so yeah if you have anything to to share on that that'd be great yeah absolutely yeah so the the cam basically it was a uh, shape files kml's um and then i've uh, basically you know beat my head against the wall for the better part of two years developing just developing some code playing around with some code largely derived out of mapi um to help produce those so I need one final push to get it all uploaded to GitHub because that's kind of the last part of it. Um, so this might be the push that uh, gets gets it out to GitHub. <laughs> For sure. Uh, all right. Are there any other questions out there? No, I'm not not hearing any. Uh, again. 
thank you. Thank you all for this great, great presentation. And uh, again, this meeting was being recorded, so we will get this uploaded as soon as possible for others to listen in, or if you want to listen back over it uh, in the future. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. you. Any questions, feel free to reach out to us.